Um, yep. But welcome to Data Lake, how Red Hat maintains data quality across multiple Drupal sites, longest title ever. <laughs> um, I am April Size, I'm a senior engineer, senior software engineer at Red Hat, also that means back end Drupal developer. Um, I am part of the team that manages developers.redhat.com, cloud.redhat.com, and kubernetesbyexample.com. And I am Melissa Bent. Hello. <laughs> I'm also a senior software engineer, which is a generic term at Red Hat for, in our case, a Drupal backend Drupal developer. Um, but I am currently the lead engineer for the Drupal portions of Customer Portal, which is access.redhat.com. Great, so we're going to go through this. We're going to talk a little bit about the problem we were trying to solve and a little bit about the discovery process that happens to come to in our solution and then how some examples of how we're integrating with the data lake um, at Red Hat. So first we'll start with the problem. So redhat.com is built on multiple Drupal sites and we have some single page apps like React and Vue. We also have organization level data that should be consistent and accurate across all of redhat.com. This could be like product information or taxonomies, um, that sort of thing. And right now, because we have all these multiple different sites and applications, um, this data is duplicated and it's also managed by different teams. You know, we just said that we were on certain sites, um, certain different sites. Um, each of these Drupal sites is managed and apps are managed by different people. And so in order to man manage the data quality across redhat.com, it's a manual process of uh, propagating information through teams of people. So there has to be a better way to share data across the redhat.com ecosystem and make things reusable. So now I'm going to pass this off to Lisa to talk about, or start off the talk about our discovery process. So just for full disclosure, um, I started at Red Hat just about two years ago, <coughs> a little over a year ago. So we actually came into this, this process mid-discovery. So there are a lot of people who were involved in this, but we kind of took the torch and carried it forward. So just want to make sure that that's clear <laughs> from the very beginning. Um, but we needed to um, we needed to have people share their data in a scalable and maintainable way, and specifically. It's not just, uh, like we just, what came from this talk about decoupled Drupal. Thank you very much. John. Yeah. Yes. So one of the biggest, most toughest things is when you have data that is becoming stale or has some sort of manual process to create. And we don't want it to make, to be harder for people to work on things. So we want them to be able to use their preferred tooling to do something, whether that's a developer or a content manager. And one of those things that is not happening right now is that process. It's, a, it's very, very manual. Um, it also doesn't scale as well as we would like. Redhat.com, not just the, the main like parent site, Redhat.com, but all of our child sites as well, such as the customer portal and developers and all the sister sites that you were <laughs> Um, they have a lot of traffic that comes through them, and people come through them for a variety of reasons. So, in that way, we have to. It has to be scalable. It has to work, and it has to be up all the time. So that was one thing that we were trying to work with as well. And Drupal sometimes can can uh, struggle with that. And I know there are like, ways to cache it and different things like that. I've built performance large scale applications in Drupal before. But we were just thinking, is there a different way for us to do this and allow us to leverage this idea of shared data? So we uh, also have a number of developers that work in different tech stacks. Like we work in Drupal, but we have a number of teams that work in custom things or in Java, in Salesforce. We have all these different sources of data that are coming in and we can't ask them, please change everything to Drupal. <laughs> because it just doesn't work for them, and it's expensive to make that kind of like, assumption on other people's time. So that's another thing that we were talking through. And specifically, we wanted something that would serve as a, as a single place that someone could go to get information on, in my case, the customer portal. Right? And a fr good friend of mine describes the customer portal as uh, multiple sites in a big trench coat. So we have a lot of uh, sites that exist at subpaths, so you can go to one subpath and you're actually on a completely different server, right? And that happens a lot. Um, when you're at enterprise level, that happens quite a bit more than people. I mean, if, if you're doing it right, then 
people don't even know that they've gone somewhere else. But this happens quite often. So when that happens, we wanted to make sure that above all else, that not only does the customer not, not notice that it's happening, but hopefully the developer experience doesn't suffer because of it. Right. And then the, uh, let's see, I'm trying to read something. Yeah, so we also wanted to have a very strong schema for this process. And there were a lot of, a lot of meetings that went into developing a schema for this. And really what it comes down to is what kind of data do we need to share? How do we need to access it? You know, how can we identify it and make sure that it's separated from one another so that way we don't like, step on each other's toes? When we have teams like this, I mean, we're international, so we've got now 20,000 employees across Red Hat. So it's like we've got all these teams working together with large amounts of data. How do we make it so that so-and-so overnight doesn't overwrite my stuff over here by accident, right, and take down portions of the site or whatever? So how can we make sure that that works well, scales well, and serves our customers as best we can? On your, on your schema, are you trying to be compliant with schema.org? We started that way. Uh -huh. um, we actually tried to. But our data is weird. <laughs> and we're not publishing the schema. Okay. So because we're not publishing it, it's not going to be part of our like our, our actual published uh, web pages. So it's, it's not searchable and problem. It's pur searching. purely internal. Okay. Purely internal. So we ended up changing it because it didn't serve us well. But we did try. We did try. Um, but it just did not work. And I'll have to do that. Yeah, so just like in a discovery process to find a solution that's going to meet the requirements that she was talking about, there are let's see, one, two, three, four, five different data repository types. And I'm going to go over these. Um, but like um, I put the data mart and operational data store under data warehouse because they're very related. Like a data mart is um, a, like a smaller scale version of a data warehouse and the operational data store like feeds temporary data into the data warehouse. So I didn't go over those in particular. Um, so when we talk about a relational database, you can think about your Drupal database. Um, the structured, as structured uh, transactional data and the main features are data normalization and compliance. It's, it's relational, it's, um, the schema is very controlled at the, the database um, layer. So then a data warehouse just doesn't seem to like meet the needs of what we're looking for. It's more focused on business intelligence focus, it has structured data, and it has schema on right. So it's still very managed in the data warehouse end of things. And then we found the data lakes. So the data lakes are very uh, flexible in structure. They're scalable um, schema on read. So you define the schema when you're um, Reading, I guess it's low maintenance, so a lot of the management and stuff has to happen outside of the data lake. It doesn't control a lot of those things. So, one of the things that you run into with the data lake, or in general, if you're abstracting the data away from its source, is data rot, which is not my word, but is one we use internally, which is basically like what happens when it gets outdated, unreliable. How do you manage this effectively? You've got governance, which is a number one thing that we needed to make sure happened well. Because if you don't govern your data and how it goes in and how it goes out, your schema falls apart because, as she just said, the data lake solution we chose doesn't care about what you put in. It just presents it to you. So all of the management of the schema takes place on our end. right? How we put it in is the governance portion of it. And that was, number one, what we wanted to make sure happened. Um, and Additionally, like how do you go through the, it's the whole thing? It's not just putting it in. It's how do we revise it? How do we tell everybody we revised it? You know, how do we publicize all of this stuff? Like we had to figure all that out to make sure that we were ready to go, so that when people come in and want to add things into the data lake or a new collection or something like this, then we can say, here you go. Here's the documentation for that, and it is not out of date because we update it all the time. Because everyone knows that documentation can can become a problem. So. That is, that is something that we, we worked on a lot in, initially. Um, and then we also talk about compliance, because data privacy is a thing, right? Our data lake is not for PII. No personally identifiable information goes inside this data lake. It is specifically for data related to our products and services, not for our users, okay? So we wanted to make sure that that was very clear, and that's part of our governance plan as well. We're like, don't put stuff in there. Like, we don't, because our intention for the use case of this is for others to be able to reuse our data elsewhere. And we don't want to have to say, oh, but don't use this section. Right? We want them to not accidentally expose something that they shouldn't. So we have rules about that as well. 
We have security on it, which we're, we're still, this is all, by the way, this is all like hot the press. <laughs> Some of these integrations we literally just launched like last month. So we're still working on this as we go and working through problems as they come up. But so far it's been going, I think it's serving the, serving the need that it was meant to address. And security is one of them. We have to make sure that um, there are certain bits of data that go in there that for us are gated content. So we want to make sure that they stay gated. So that someone, again, within Red Hat can't accidentally grab something they shouldn't and make it public when they shouldn't. Because everyone knows once it's on the internet, it's there forever. <laughs> so we want to make sure that that is also protected. And then also we have um, the availability of the site. Because um, one thing that we talked about, because we have all these sources and all these different teams working on things, those represent points of failure, possible points of failure, right? Every single one of those teams. By aggregating it into a data link, that becomes one place. And it, yes, it can be scary, because now you're like, well, now I have a single point of failure. But at the same time, you have one place to look for when something goes wrong, if something goes wrong. But it's also very simple, right? The actual device itself is serving this up is very simple. So um, it, it has a, a, a layer of protection over your, over your availability numbers. So is your data lake serving as a canonical source of information, or is it simply an aggregation? Um, right now it's aggregation. Mm -hmm. As we migrate off, it will become canonical. It will become canonical. Yeah. We're, we're still, like I said, we're still in the process of moving people over to it, and we're doing like a trickle of users onto it, because we want to control the use cases so we can address them one by one. Oh, this is still me. <laughs> so, um, I think I already talked about some of these, but specifically the, the third one is one that I like, which is that it provides an additional layer of caching, basically. Because whatever you put into the data lake, like one of the use cases that we're, we're going to touch on barely, but we have this idea of shared um, rendered content, which we're calling content syndication. But um, like you mentioned, John, I'm pointing at John for the recording, <laughs> in the, the decoupled presentation, where you have uh, a uh, pattern kit, which sits on top of Layout Builder. Um, so you use Layout Builder to build something, a pattern or something like that. You store that, you could technically, right, store that rendered copy and it becomes basically an, an internal ad repository, right, where you have all the rendered stuff, you add in your assets, like whatever CSS or JSON you could include, and then people could actually like pick up those ads and show them in multiple places across multiple sites. And it all comes from the data lake. And because it's tied to other things in the data lake, you can actually make it uh, specific to what you're looking at. So this is an initiative that currently is in progress. But that's something that um, you, since it's already rendered, it would already be rendered content that HTML that you're storing. So you don't have to go back. You wouldn't have to wait for Drupal to render it every time. Yeah, so it's already there. So that's like, like a basic, like a kind of a caching layer on top of your content. <coughs> what is? The solution. Is this still me? Yes. We did not organize this well. <laughs> I, I get to talk a lot all at once, and I'm really sorry about that. April, say hi. Hi. That's fine. <laughs> um, I did a lot of this like early work on this, and she has a very specific implementation that I think is very interesting. So we will, April will get to talk, I promise. Um, but we needed uh, something flexible, so we went ahead and went with MongoDB. MongoDB, <coughs> you just put a a JSON object into it and store it that way. It doesn't care about schemas, it's scalable, it works really well for our purposes, so that's what we went with. Uh, I built a custom module on Search API that indexes into MongoDB. And it's also, uh, it, I call them, I've been, I've been calling them internally contributed modules because I make a contrib module for Red Hat because it's, and the reason it's internal full disclosure, because I am very much contrib first, okay? <laughs> it's just because it's so specific to our tech stack, right, that it doesn't make sense. But we are looking at abstracting these kinds of things and contributing them back um, once we know that it's what we want to do. Uh, but basically what it does is I added an event, an event subscriber on indexing that allows you to apply your schema to your data. And the schema is the part that's configurable per instance, right? So like for developers, they have their own schema of like how their data gets mapped. And then I have mine for the data that I'm putting into the data lake. 
and uh, it sits on top of Search API. So you get all the really good things that Search API offers, right? It's a really robust module, it's an accepted module, it works really well, it's great support. It has all the, the management capabilities of deleting everything, re-indexing everything, all that stuff. So that's all included. If you want to say, don't put any unpublished things in there, that's all configurable just like normal. And it'll index into the, the data lake. So it was a custom backend as well? Yeah. To work for MongoDB? Yeah, so it was a custom backend to work with our version, our instance of MongoDB. That's so the custom you, Are you sharding your MongoDB? We do have shards, but I will say that we don't, our team doesn't maintain that. Another team maintains the MongoDB instance for us. Uh, we offloaded that onto our IT team for that. This is still me. <laughs> <laughs> we just talked about this. This didn't seem as long when we were testing it. <laughs> it just feels really long right keep now. Going. <laughs> I also like that this is only recording. <laughs> uh, so, okay, you talked about that already. Yeah, you talked about that. Yeah. 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 I'm, really I'm really good at presentations if you didn't realize that. <laughs> um, but yeah, oh, the one thing I didn't talk about was access control. So you get all the tools of Drupal for access control, management, CMS, all the, the, the data um, modeling processing of Drupal is still present and useful the way you always have used it, except that now you're just taking the results of those and putting them into a different backend source, basically. You're kind of like your presentation layer is the data link, right? And so our, for our retrieval, um, the current, the two examples we're going to show you, um, the one on customer portal is using GraphQL and a single page application. Um, and so like she was talking about how MongoDB is controlled by a different, whole different, or maintained by a whole different group. GraphQL is also maintained by a whole different group at Red Hat. Um, so I'm not super familiar with it, but she'll go over a little bit more about how the, the single page app is working. Um, in my solution, we used the PHP MongoDB driver and created a service that can query the database directly because we didn't have, like we were like pushing forward and the GraphQL stuff wasn't going to be ready. Um, so there is a way to um, to do queries and things like that to directly to the MongoDB instance. Back to Melissa. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> so. This is a very specific instance, and this is actually, this was my proof of concept, which I built my entire thing around, which is our slash products page. <laughs> it's the only one that's running on it right now because it was something that was attainable and it allowed us to build the back end necessary to then expand it to other things, right? So this is basically our proof of concept. It's live right now, so if you go to access.redhead.com slash products, that page is built in Next.js, and it pulls data directly from our data lake. Um, well, okay, it's a little bit different, but I'll tell you specifically. But just for a customer portal, what it does, the reason I made this decision is that um, for customer portal, the reason people come to our site is to get information and support and help on our products, right? It's product-centric, so we have to do products well, I think. And then we also have, to, we have multiple teams working on these things. And because of all those teams that we have going on, um, it requires enhanced communication, but also enhanced collaboration to make it work. So this is a way for us to get that done. Um, when we do build this out, right now this is what it looks like. It's just, this is the index page. It's just a large index of, of products. Um, and the, the funny thing about this is that when we launched it, we sent out an email and said, hey everybody, it looks exactly the same. <laughs> but, nothing, but nothing is the same at the same time. Um, originally, for scope, so you guys understand what this was, um, we needed to get an enhanced version of the product index experience up for uh, an event last year. And we just didn't have the time because it, like, it was like a few weeks to get this whole thing up. So we ended up having to do custom HTML directly into like a node, which is soul sucking. Nobody wants to do this. And of course, that's what we had to do for a long time until we could replace it. And not only, on top, not only do we have that, we have revisions and translation on top of that. So every single time we changed it, we had to update all three of the languages we support for the portal. So there were four, basically four updates that had to be done every single time one thing was updated. Mm -hmm. And since it's a page, not like a custom content type, a page, anyone can edit and update pages on the portal. <laughs> I mean, any Red Hatter can. Which means that we didn't have the, the data quality control that we wanted. Um, and it, also, our front-end developer who was working on this was like, I have to go update the product index page again. And it was just, he hated it, just because it's, it's tough to do. Um, so we launched it, 
And it looks exactly the same. This is the, uh, the expanded view. And this is the translated view. Or one of the translated views of it. And I didn't expand the things. You guys can, that's homework for you. If you really want to go look at it, you can expand all the, all the drop downs and everything. But this page, as you see it today, or as in these screenshots, was from our, our build, right? And the cool thing about it was that it uh, is managed in Drupal. It is indexed to the data lake like we talked about. We query it via GraphQL. And in that query, he gets all the information that he needs to build that page, including all the translations at the same time. He builds them statically. He builds the versions of the page statically using our GitLab pipeline. And then it's served via Next.js. And right now, we're refreshing it every 30 minutes just to get it out there, just for now. We're working on iterating on that, too. So this page is now, when we update it in Drupal within 30 minutes, or if we really need it, we manually push it, then it's updated right away, right? And we get the, not just the data quality and management side of it, but we get uh, reactions. Because the other thing that we've done on this customer portal is we've integrated it with our product lifecycle data. So I wrote an integration, it's actually a migration, like a classic Drupal migration, that connects with our lifecycle API. And anytime a any name change comes through, it pulls it in, which then gets indexed to the data link, which then gets put up on the side, right? So now whenever someone in China which is one of our product lifecycle teams, they update the title of the product, it, it's on the site within 30 minutes, mm. right? And it's in a central, centralized place, and not only that, it's structured data now, instead of one big blob of HTML, which means that now, we're setting up for something we'll talk about in a minute. <laughs> April. Cool, yeah, so on the developer site, we did uh, a data lake, so she has a data lake uh, collection for products and we've sh separated it out for the learning path stuff. We have our own separate collection within MongoDB specifically to share learning path content between sites. So a learning path is a curated collection of content. Um, it could be like articles, ebooks, cheat sheets and things that are directing a user to learn more about a particular topic or product. Um, so the first site that we went with was developers, .com. Yeah, she was first. She beat me <laughs> to, to deploying her stuff. To deploying, yeah. yes. Um, so yeah, this site exists to help uh, developers learn about new products and technologies. The idea is that the content, that any content that can be part of a learning path, like an article, a cheat sheet, for example, those are two standalone pages on developers. Um, they're indexed into the data lake uh, learning paths collection. And then once that content is indexed, it can be a part of a learning path. And the way this works is we have a learning path content type and we have a resource content type. Learning paths reference resources through an entity reference field. Um, we're using any browser contrib module for this uh, nice little display here to be able to add the things. You can see a card display of each of the resources that have already been added. Um, like those images and information in those cards, the content type is page. That's all coming from the data lake, and I'll talk about that in a minute, how that's working. Um, yeah, and they can create a resource if they want to. Um, so the resource node really acts as a container for the data lake content. Um, we're using external data source contrib module right now to um, have an autocomplete field where when you start typing, um, you know, looking for something in the title of content. You can see all the different uh, options from the data lake. You can see they have like acronyms for which site it comes from, uh, what type of content it is, what language it is, and then the title. And when you select one of those, it puts the data lake um, unique identifier in the field. So we're also using um, automatic entity labels so that when you save this node, the title from the data lake data will become the title of the resource and we're using allow only one contrib module so that we don't have multiple copies of resources referencing the same thing in the data lake. <coughs> so if you look back at our examples, the stuff that I have in the red boxes here, lots of red, um, are coming from the learning path nodes. So we've got hero content that is on these resources. We've got the list of resources, and then on the right side you can see um, this particular resource is in blue in the sidebar now. Um, to let you know where you are in, in the path. And then the rest of the content there is driven by data lake data. I think the title might be coming from the resource, but the rest of it, like what type of content and the content itself is all coming from the data lake. 
So how we're doing that is we're using pre-processed node to run the query um, to find the content from the data lake and put it into the render array so on Twig they can do the data, um, do with whatever they want with the data. Um, we also have, you know, like in the theme, there's other functions that help massage the data for certain needs, um, but that can be done on a site-by-site -site basis. <coughs> So we did this all <laughs> in an internal Pinterest module um, that can be shared internally because it is very specific to um, our needs. Um, so all the work that we did for the data lake integration lives in the shared module. Um, the module primarily defines the schema like she was talking about. So if we wanted a site to interact with the learning path data lake, we want them to use this module because that's where the schema is defined. Um, then there's also services used, the primary things are the schema and the services to query the data lake. Um, there's also lots of reusable code for like the hero block, the sidebar nav, some previous next buttons, things like that. Um, just being able to pr uh, pull everything together in a consistent way across other sites that are using it. Um, there's a controller, so when we are looking at that sort of contextual view with the hero and the sidebar nav and the resource to the right, um, that is a controller so that resources can be um, referenced by multiple learning paths and still be able to be seen in the context of each of those learning paths. Um, and then the event subscriber, which was part of the, the index module that Melissa created um, that helps to pre-process the data before. So each site that's um, indexing content into the data lake can pre-process and tweak the data before it goes in. And we have some constraints and validators just to make sure that the resource still exists when you're making the resource, when you're referencing it, um, just to keep things consistent and working as expected. Yeah, so right now, right now, we're in the process of taking the shared module, which we of course had to push really quickly so it, it needs some tweaking to actually make it shareable, <laughs> um, and putting it on the cloud.redhat.com site. And um, yeah, so, this way, like once that is complete, then the Red Hat Cloud, hybrid cloud site can then reference content for the developer site. The developer site can reference content in the cloud site for learning paths. Future plans. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any questions about what she just said though, before no. we move on? Just because it, it's kind of cool. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> All of it, you have a question? Yeah, so the, the schema side of it is you're using search API. Does the schema automatically create your index, or do you still have to manually field index and search API? So the index we do have to create. That's mostly because we have like a like a whole process around creating accounts and stuff mm -hmm. with within Red Hat. Um, I think that we could probably do that. I just didn't because I knew that we'd have to do it ourselves anyway. So I didn't put any time into that part. But you could. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the schema it lives in the shared module and it's just like an array. It's, so we have like a base schema for all of the content and then we have, for learning class, we had different content types like article, um, web page, and they're, they're trying to be very generic so that, you know, like in the cloud site, all of their resources are resource nodes. Like that's just what they called it. So I'm translating that to web page. And then when it, whatever site is using or displaying that content can say, this is a web page, what do we want to label it? We want to label it page, or you know, they can, they can dictate those types of labeling, you know, and that's fine. And that was one of the things I was really interested in when I made that index module. I wanted to make no assumptions about the data that was coming in. So a lot of it's a manual process of making your schema, but that was on purpose. <laughs> um, because, I mean, we've all worked with contrib modules that kind of make assumptions and you have to work around them, right? So I didn't want to do that in this instance, so. Um, one of the things that we're planning on expanding on um, once as we move forward is shared patterns, which I kind of talked about. I touched on having rendered content in the data lake that we can then reshare. And this is to allow our marketing team to be able to then schedule things out. Because, you, you know, again, you have all the things that you have with Drupal. You can schedule publication. Once it's published, it gets pushed to the data lake, which then means it's available for everybody else to show. And as we work, work through all of that, we will also have, at least on the customer portal, because this is my plan, <laughs> that's what I'm in charge of, um, is that we want to, uh, let's see, the middle, the middle bullet point is I want to make a product taxonomy that then is standardized, that gives us a unified ID, and from the data, but a unified ID for all products. So that way if changes come in, 
then we can trickle them through all of our web properties across all of Red Hat.com. That's my, my vision anyway. Um, because again, products are core what we do. So that's why we're doing it this way. Uh, the other thing which is the next step for the customer portal side is to actually automate the building of all of our, our product pages on customer portal. So slash products, the index page itself is automated today. The next thing would be to take product slash star and make those all automated. So that way, that would become a decoupled situation. And we're going to be, we're looking at the server side rendering for that. Because if we do static, since we have translation, that equates to a lot of pages that we do not want to store individually. Um, but we also don't want to rely on the customer's browser to have to do all the hard work to lift all that out. And plus, with SEO, if you do it on the client side, then you don't get all of the rendered page data when it's being called. So we want to do the server side rendering to um, give us a boost in performance and SEO friendliness and all these different things. So that, that's like what we're currently working on for the next iteration of our data lake data. Uh, the next set of work after that <laughs> is to incorporate more teams. So we've got product lifecycle again, I talked talk to you about that team. They have um, a lot of product information about Red Hat's products like end of life data, documentation links, those kinds of things. Um, we have those kinds of things that we aren't currently incorporating into our work, which we would like to. And uh, case management, which is a really big one. If we can make this available for them in some way that makes sense, then we'll be, we'll be working with them on that. And then also to cross-pollinate our data with people like developers.redhat.com, cloud.redhat.com, pull those kinds of things into our site and say, hey, you are using this product. Did you know that you can spin up a local of your own and test it out on developers.redhat.com? Wouldn't that be cool? You know, those kinds of things. But then we wouldn't be driving that data. They would, because they're the ones who own it. It makes sense. So that's the kind of stuff that we're, we're working on for our next steps. So that way we can have complete control over the experience of our customers. And that is all for today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> Do you have any questions on top? Yes. I have like a million questions. Um, <laughs> So how do you put it currently? How do you put the data in? Do you find out your own content types with fields and stuff like that? Yeah, so that process is all <coughs> standard Drupal. Content type, field, s s storage that has its own Drupal database. So that's its own separate thing. And, but then, then, and then the search API module is what takes care of it. it into the And then what happens if some other Drupal site that has another structure wants to use that, that data? Wants to use our data? Yeah, that, the data that's on the ladder lake. Um, they can use the GraphQL endpoint that we have. But they have to, to put point. their own thing as well, to pull it into their own kind of tool. If they wanted to, but one of the things about governance that we talked about is that we don't want people storing our data in their site because that leads to data rot. We want them pulling it from us unless there's a very, very good reason for them to do so, mm -hmm. like the product index or the product taxonomy I talked about. But if you do that, we would them be able to edit that data or contribute to the data, or the governance is just you are the author and you are only allowed to. Yeah, so that's the canonical source thing that we're talking about. We don't want them recreating our data, we want them coming to us for our data. Um, so we are the canonical source for our data, and they are customers. Data, it has to go through you. Yes. For products. And for products specifically. And the biggest reason for that is that we don't want, we don't want to, we don't want to have to, uh, we get reports all the time right now from people saying, well, it says here that this, and it says here that this, right? And that's because you have people, different content editors and management processes working on things. Whereas if you have it coming from a single source where we manage, like in our instance, we manage it, we put it up, we push it through, and that they are just ingesting our data, and they can ingest, if they ingest it and it's automated, but they don't edit it, that's fine. Because then you can have your own caching and do your own thing, with, that's fine. As long as you're not modifying it, right? Okay. So as long as you're a client of our data, but not a contributor to it in your own way, right? And once this data lake gets kind of big, yeah. how, that, how do other people find that data? I mean, if, how do they know there's an article referencing something that they're writing about? <coughs> without knowing already that, that article was there in the data lake? It depends on their use case. So we have uh, like support engineers that will look for solutions in articles, and they have their own integration with it, which I leave to them to do. However, we would work with them and say, this is the collection you need to look at, 
and then they would build their own like auto complete process on that, right? Their own search, their own whatever, because they know the needs of their search the best. But we would collaborate with them on that integration. Yeah. Exactly, potential to have duplicate content. Please. Yeah, we don't want to duplicate. That's exactly what we don't want to do, and that's where the governance comes in because we don't we have that now. With <laughs> well, we have that now just because we have so many sites that all need the same data. Yeah. You mentioned the inclusion of the GraphQL as a team. Mm -hmm. and Worked on GraphQL. Is that team basically ingest the data from your uh, search API in order to populate to drive that GraphQL? Yeah. So we have to, we actually have, <laughs> we have two layers of GraphQL. So ours is a subgraph of GraphQL, and then we have a supergraph that stitches the subgraphs together. And um, they uh, we collaborate with them to make the schema work properly. Against our against the data link, and that's where the scheme, like agreed upon schema, matters. Yeah. So that way, the biggest thing is that we will have we call it we call it kind of like primary data and secondary data. Primary data is something that every piece of data in the data lake will have, and secondary allows you to vary. So primary data is where you have a title, created date, updated date, all the stuff you would expect in like a note table maybe, and secondary would be like other fields that are specific to a piece of content or to a learning path or whatever. And then they, we work together with them to make that GraphQL um, like integration with them. Yeah. Follow up to that question. Sure. Um, is there any transformation of the Drupal field named data that needs to occur in between grabbing the data from the search API and throwing it into a already agreed upon, perhaps not Drupal specific schema? Sure. In GraphQL. That depends on your schema. It also depends on what you're looking for. I do because I feel like Drupal is a bit opinionated about how it stores things. I mean, remember the Drupal 7 days with language none, zero value, or target ID, or whatever it was? Um, and what I want is to make it so people don't have to know Drupal to access the data. And I don't want to have Drupal like kind of polluting the data structure that way. It needs it for what it does, and that's fine. But I don't want other teams to have to know how to work with Drupal to be able to work with our data. So we try to make it as clean as possible, and that's the only transformation process that happens. I will say that the way I wrote the index module, and I feel like now that I should look at it and see if I can make it just contrib like right away. I feel like I might be able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> like, I feel like this should be out there. So um, the uh, basically you create an array of your schema, and you can even nest them if you want to. And then as it comes, if you match your names from Search API to the names of your schema, it just maps them for you. Okay. That's all it does. And it, and it, it relies on all search APIs transformations. So if you're like, I want the, the name of this taxonomy term, it indexes the name of the taxonomy term, right? So that it's all configurable that way. We had to add a couple of little things on there to like make languages work for our schema, but you can still do it that way. Mostly because we wanted one record, and the way search API wants to do it is to have one record per language, and we didn't want that. We wanted one canonical record per piece of content. So we, that's, the, that's the only reason we had to make changes to the schema. Out of the box, it should just literally take whatever you name it in Search API and stick it into your schema, into the model. Yeah. It sounds to me like what you're describing is, like if we were to describe what you're talking about it in a, in a flow chart, the part of the process that is responsible for transforming the data so that it's good to go mm -hmm. in GraphQL is still of your side. So, that is true, <laughs> yes. Mostly because um, when we initially started working on this, that's what I thought we were gonna do. I didn't think we were gonna have any transformations going on with GraphQL, because we were trying to make it be automated. Like GraphQL would just read it and go with it. And that's why I was trying to make it as clean as possible. Um, but also, I, I'm just neurotic that way. <laughs> I like my data to be as beautiful as I can. Um, so I, I did do a lot of work on that to make it really pretty. That is, you know, from a developer's perspective, or what pretty is. But uh, it's like a really clean JSON object, right? That people can can is very readable. Um, but yes, there is on my side. You could make it like just you could literally just shove it in there as is, and then write some GraphQL transforms and make it work that way too. Just depends on where your strengths are, right? If your strengths are in PHP and you want to be as clean as possible, you do it there. If you want to do it over here, you can. But also, the nice thing about this is that if someone like April is not going through GraphQL, they still get the same data. It's still just as pretty, right? So you might as well start with it that way. And then, uh, 
and then there's less post process after the fact. It's stored in the way you want it to be from the beginning. Yeah. How many documents do you have currently? How many, how many documents do I have? Do the other lady have? I don't know how many you have. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that for products we have uh, we have ninety. Ninety. Right now, that's not. I know, like I said, it's proof of concept. It's very small right now. But the next thing that we're onboarding is, or we're looking to onboard is our KBase, which is our articles and solutions, which is like somewhere around. I didn't look at the number. Tens. Is it? It's like twenty-five thousand. Yeah. Something like that. So it's still like a moderate level. I mean, I've done sites that have like millions of nodes, right? So it's not like it's not like that big, but it could scale that direction. It just hasn't yet. And would would that other knowledge base use the same schema you just defined, or would it have its own schema? It would have its own schema, but it would have the same primary set of fields. So the same data lake centric fields, which are the, the title, the, the the ones we agreed upon that we're going to share across all of our schema. And then the rest of them, the secondary fields would be would uh, diverge based on the need of the content. Yeah. Do you have any like uh, auto discovery of the schemas, or are you thinking about that for? That's the, the direction we want to go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then exposing that so that as the new teams come in, it just kind of takes a life of its own. Yeah. That's the thought. The the the, word, the words that keep coming through, and I've told my front end developers this, and they're they're weeping with joy, is that I want to get them out of the content game. Yeah. I don't want my developers, who are skilled, trained individuals, typing content for our content editors. Right. I don't want them doing that. That's a waste of their time. It's also not a reason that they want to stay working. Like why I come in today, I have to I, like like my my developer for the index page. Oh. The index. He, I actually told it after we launched it, I was like, you guys, we launched the index page. He goes, I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> because it's just, he's like, it just works. I don't have to touch it anymore. And it was so exciting. So now we can find the good things, right? We can work smarter, not harder. To not, I mean, I know people do use that all the time, but it's true, right? Use the, the right tool for the job. And this is absolutely overbuilt for the thing that we have it on right now. It's 100% overbuilt to make a product index page. And I know this. However, we are now positioned to use that data for a lot of other things. And that's exciting to me. That's mm -hmm. a nerdy person. That's the same thing with developers. It, it looks like we did a lot of weird stuff to get this work, like just entity reference everything. But the idea is the shareability. Yeah. And that's that's sort of the next phase. Yeah. We want shareability, we want findability. And um, you know, we've been I've been having meetings like when I say meetings like I, I didn't realize until I came into Red Hat just how big it is. Like Red Hat's very, very large. And everybody else apparently knows this except for me. But I came in and I was like, I want to talk to so-and-so. And they're like, oh, well, that's this team. I want to talk to so-and-so, that's this team. You know, so I had like 10 meetings with people. And all of them were like, oh, I love the idea of having abstract or product data. When, do you, when can you have it done? And I was like, oh, my God. I don't know sometime soon. Um, so everyone wants it, but nobody wants to be the author of it and build it. And I was like, well, we will do that. Because the customer portal, I mean, anybody who's in support knows, support sites have the strongest requirements for data and for data to, to stay around, right? Marketing cares about new stuff. Support cares about everything, literally everything. Like, oh, this was made in, you know, the, no, no one has this on any servers anymore. I'm like, well, we keep it for posterity, right? And support will have it. We will have documentation on that, that kind of thing. Just as soon as somebody says nobody has it, somebody will call in. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. We actually had a situation where there was like some random server running this really, really old version of one of our server softwares, and it was cleaning our site every 30 minutes. And people were like, oh, look, he's still working. <laughs> you can see it in our metrics coming in, you know, like that the, something was like running through our CVEs to look for vulnerabilities for that particular product and it would scrape our site every time. I was like, well, nobody uses that anymore. And they're like, well, it's not supported. I'm like, well, we're blocking that traffic then. <laughs> because, you know, like, we, it's unsupported anymore and they're tanking everything else. So, mm -hmm. like, that's the kind of thing you, you, metrics are good for that. But support requires that kind of, that kind of deep knowledge and for it to stay around. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you all for coming. Yeah.